So anyway, here we are. And what I thought I, we would do today is help each other out with days gone wrong. I think that sounds fun. That's something I would like help with when I had my kids growing up. For those of you who don't know me, maybe I need to do the little introduction. I'm Julie Bogart. I own Brave Writer, which is the online program and classes for language arts and writing for homeschool families. And what we do in the Brave Writer community is help parents become effective writing coaches and allies to their children. I'm also a coach for homeschoolers. I have five grown kids ages 19 to 28. I homeschooled them for 17 years. My kids did varying amounts of public school in high school. One hated it and quit. <laughs> a couple went full time and then we had some part timers. So I've experienced a wide range of educational situations and circumstances. Um, I always like to say that I homeschooled my students in high school because the public school experience just felt like another feature of our homeschooling life. It still required the me that homeschooled them the whole way. And I look forward to talking about that another time. But anyway, the point is, <laughs> I love talking about education and family culture. And one of the things that sort of thwarts that whole experience of family culture is when the day goes bad, when the toddler falls apart, when you've got bored children moping around, whining, when they just keep wanting to do the, you know, nagging and the poking and the, you know, just hanging on your coattails or irritating each other. So, yo, yes, how many of you had that day today? Annie says that was her house. Oh, yes, fighting and hitting, Esther says. Let's hear some more ways the days go wrong when you keep being interrupted. In fact, I noticed something. Oh, yeah, I got to keep these on. I noticed something for me that was really frustrating having five kids. It's like you couldn't get your brain to finish a thought. Every time you started to think through something, oh my goodness, suddenly there's a kid talking in your ear, asking a question, wanting help with the juice. Yeah, puppy barking at the cat, screaming at each other, newborn crying. Dawn, yes, exactly. That's every day with my five and two year old. I was proactive today and only did basics, just got home from a trip. Good, very good. Dyslexic children who can't get through all of the work. Leslie says it can even happen with one child. Yeah, exactly. There is this feeling that we're supposed to have eternal peace <laughs> in our homes, uh, that everyone is going to get along. We should start with the assumption, of course, that we're going to see days where kids don't get along, where irritability grows and frustration bubbles over. So first we wanna just normalize the rough days, right? That's gonna be a part of our lives. But there are ways, oh, it, Rosie says that I keep freezing. Am I freezing for anyone else? Just curious. You might need to update the app if that's the case. You could swipe out, update the app and come back. Okay, good, no freezing for most people, awesome. So I'll keep going. So once you normalize the experience that days don't always go well, you can plan for the day that doesn't go well. How about that? Instead of planning for things to go well, what if we like think ahead to things not going well, right? That seems like a logical strategy. So what I want to ask before I share my ideas is what are some of the ways you've turned around a day that's gone wrong? What have you done that's been effective? So I'm excited to read what you write. Anyone have some ideas? What do you do when a day is <clears throat> and you want to reset it? Sort of like rebooting the computer. One, let go of my agenda. Two, go out for a walk. Go play outside, go outside. Movie and popcorn, that is fabulous. Change of pace, going outside is huge. Reading a book, let go of doing so much. <laughs> Jumping on the trampoline. Talking to homeschool friends who understand. Exactly, cuddle up with popcorn in a documentary. Stop and sit quietly. Dawn says worship music, and right beneath her, someone else says blast some music. The trampoline or the library, those activate two very different parts of us. Playing a game, awesome. Talking and sharing. 
Uh, let's see. Rebecca says they had one yesterday. She read a book and they hiked, um, and the kids watched Carmen San Diego bake cookies. Wonderful. Oh my gosh. You guys have great ideas. Board games and tea time. Um, in fact, board games is on my list. I think sometimes what everyone is craving is coming together. It's not just that they are aimless. It's that they have no current group context to fit into. Nature walk. Yes. In Brave Rider, we have a saying that when things go bad, you can always add brownies. And I see people having cookies on here. If you'll notice, my little uh, username in Periscope has a cookie on each side because I couldn't find any brownies. But that's exactly the idea. Very good. Oh, lock myself in my room. My kids aren't usually as much of a problem as I am. Oh, that's so incredibly honest. Thank you, Annie. I know that feeling. And sometimes giving yourself a mommy time out is a great idea. A great idea. Uh, pop in a video or DVD they use now <laughs> and hop in the shower and reboot. Exactly. Well, this is great. You guys have great ideas. Now, yeah, I don't even think you need mine. But I'm going to give you some anyway because, hey, I'm here and we got time to kill. <laughs> so here's one that I love to suggest. Um, and it just came to me during my own homeschooling years. My house was kind of a mess. I had five kids. There were seven people. We were a little bit of clutter bugs at times. And sometimes I noticed that the space lost its imaginative capacity. It's like, um, what is there to do? I will have to dig through a pile of puzzle pieces to find the art paper or the markers. Um, things weren't readily available to be played with, right? So there's this feeling of like clutter that was in my way and it made the imagination dull. So one of the things that I did, because there was no freaking possible way I was going to clean my whole house and keep it consistently beautiful at all times in order to foster imagination and creativity. So what I did is I cleared one space. And I did this on a somewhat regular basis. And this is the space I cleared. I bet you thought I was going to say the family room or the kitchen or the art room. No, I cleared the coffee table. <laughs> that was the level of effort I knew I could make with five little kids. So after the kids went to bed, I would clear off the coffee table. Whatever had been on it was gone. And then what I would put on the coffee table was something brand new no one had ever seen. This was always after they went to bed. So it would be a set of jacks with balls, or it might be a new set of pastels, or it might be a DVD, or it might be a board game or a card game. And I would just leave it there. There was no announcement. I didn't say, hey, get up, there's going to be a surprise. I just put the thing that was brand new on the only clear space in the family room after they were in bed. And when we got up in the morning and had breakfast and someone wandered into the room and discovered it, it was a change. No, not every day. This is when we needed a reset. This is when you felt like, uh-oh, today was meltdown day. Tomorrow, I don't want to repeat. I'm going to anticipate that we're sort of in a stuck place and I'm going to create some new energy. One of the most successful of these little cleared coffee table moments was when I would put out Sculpey clay. Do you guys know what that is? It's that clay that you can fashion into little things and you bake it. Um, we had Sculpey clay with a little book that gave us ideas of what we could make. And I'm not kidding. Kids playing with clay, they just get in the zone. It's like suddenly they have something to do. Their hands are busy. They're looking at the little pictures. And it requires this really strong focused attention. Now, obviously, Sculpey clay with three-year-olds doesn't work. I'm thinking of that zone, you know, somewhere between 5 and 12. But giving them something to do. Yes, perfect for during read aloud time, Rebecca. Exactly. But also just good on its own. Like sometimes they just need to wake up. In fact, one of my friends, I've mentioned her before in Periscope, Dottie. I remember she used to give each child not the bake kind of clay, and, and we did this too, I copied her idea. She would give everyone the kind of clay that could continue to be molded, and she'd put it on a cookie sheet per child. And they could be molding a whole scene over a period of time 
on this cookie sheet. And so when she needed to put it away, they'd just pick up the sheet and move it. You didn't have to worry about taking up a space on the table. So each child could have this cookie sheet that they would bring back out, play with it, and then put it away till the next time. So clay is a great one, but clear the coffee table. As you're listening, what are some ideas that you can think of, of things that could go on a cleared coffee table that might be fun to share with your kids? Any ideas? I know for us, we used pickup sticks. We did jacks. We jigsaw. Excellent. The remoldable clay is just traditional clay. You'll find it in every single store. You'll see it. It's all colors and it's not to be baked. Beads and string. Perfect. Coloring book. Wonderful. Pipe cleaners. Oh my gosh. Endlessly entertaining and inexpensive. A new picture book to read aloud. Bananagrams, wiki sticks, sculpy clay. Exactly. Exactly. You guys have the idea. Pom-poms, googly eyes, stickers. I remember getting those sticker books. Those are popular. Magnets are great. In fact, poetry magnets on a cookie sheet are fantastic. Kids love moving them around, making things. Puzzles, tongs and toys, and stickers from Brandy. These are great ideas. Foam boards. Wonderful. Thank you, Leslie. Rainbow rice. Rebecca, I don't know what that is. It sounds fascinating. Colored pencils and intricate coloring book. You guys, you've got it. Legos, new Lego sets are always welcome. Perler beads. Yes, you guys get this. You know what to do. What makes these work are two things. The element of surprise. They don't expect it in the morning. Paper masks, love that. And two, you not talking about it. <laughs> Letting them discover it. If you hang around me enough, you'll hear that doing is better than talking leaving some room for surprise, not heaping expectations. Have you ever bought something for your child and then all of a sudden they're like, well, that looks dumb. I don't want to do that. Because you've just been like, hey, it's time to have a game time. And they're like, I don't want to. But if you leave it out and you ignore it, and you go about your business, someone's going to discover it. So, oh, let's see, what did you ask? So if it throws off your normal routine, just let it go. Is that the point? Sure, sure. Because this is injecting surprise, something new. We're pulling people into the imaginative space. Do you understand? Boredom and tedium comes from a lack of imagination. So where do we get imagination from? We have to light a spark. We've got to create a spark that ignites the imag imagination. And one of the ways to do that is through surprise and something new. So I think we combine those elements on a clean coffee table and bingo. If you want your kids to get excited about art appreciation, put a stack of art books on the coffee table and leave them out. If they're the only thing there, someone's going to page through them, right? Maybe you want to buy a bunch of those little like percussive musical instruments. Jacob loved those. I went to like the local educator supply store for school and then I bought like the cowbell and the little jingle bells and the little, you know, <coughs> that thing that looks like a maraca but it has ridges on it. And I just put those out and they became his favorite thing. He used them all the time. So just imagine into your space something stimulating and novel and let your kids discover it. Oh, good. Okay. The second thing that often dispels boredom, you know, tedium, your kids are hanging on you, they're pestering each other, is a change in what they're playing with. Now, you might think I'm heading towards buying more toys. I'm not. What kids love more than anything are real tools. It's not that they want to just have the option of pretending to play with the tool, like the pretend kitchen or the pretend plastic hammer. And of course, I'm not really talking right now about zero through five. This is home education, so I'm starting with kids who are school age. So we'll let you figure out the babies. <laughs> but for school age kids, the sooner you can give them real stuff, the better. So for example, if you want your child to have fun, pull out a needle and thread. Show her how to use the big scissors and to cut out a little dress that she can sew for her little Raggedy Ann doll. If you want them to play, exactly, cooking and woodshop. One of the most successful activities of all time with my kids 
which we did during my famous obsession with Native America, <laughs> Native Americans, <laughs> was when we made rain sticks. Now, I don't know if you guys know what those are, but what we used was a um, one of those uh, tubes. In fact, I have one, and I'm going to walk over here and get it so you can see. I'm way too close to your faces right now. Okay, so I'm going to hold this up so you can see. See this tube? This is one of those mailing tubes. So what you do is you give everybody, oops, you give everybody their own mailing tube. Oh, hello, Alicia, welcome. You didn't miss too much and you can always watch the replay. Um, tap away on the hearts if this is a good, a good one so people know. Um, you get a mailing tube. You give everybody a hammer and a hunk, a huge chunk of nails. And then what you do is you open the tube and you pour in a bunch of lentils. Okay, don't do rice. Apparently rice attracts bugs. So pour in lentils, you know, the dry kind, not cooked. <laughs> and then you're going to seal up the top. And then you're going to hand your child this hammer and nails, and they're going to hammer them all over the tube as much as they can all over the whole tube. And you want them to use up the whole box. This is like the happiest experience for children. When they're done, you wrap around the tube with paper and colorful electrical tape. You, they're going to need your help for this. And then they're going to be able to flip it upside down like this, and it'll sound like rain. And just even having these to take outside and run around and do rain dances, especially if you live in California where everything's on fire, is a fabulous way to dispel some of that tedious boredom energy. So that's the one that I thought would be fun to share with you. But that's an example. You're using a hammer. You're using real nails, not fake ones. You're using something substantial that feels big and fun to hold. And each kid gets his own. And it's not expensive. It's cheap. And then you can read about, you know, Native Americans <laughs> and draw maps and get obsessed like I was. Okay, so there's that one. Another real tool, though, that is fabulous for the slightly older crowd is the sewing machine. And it's kind of a lost art right now. And I think boys and girls should get the opportunity to play with a sewing machine. Uh, I know Noah learned how to sew and loved it. We made all those, like when I talked last time about the gold rush party, we made all these little bags that you could put your gold nuggets in. And he did that on our machine together with me. Um, Katrin became a huge fan of sewing, and I ended up enrolling her in sewing classes with another homeschool mom who was a quilter, and she got quite good at it. There's something really satisfying about controlling that machine. I had a Brave Rider family whose mother was a quilter, and the first thing they did every morning, oh, look at that, Alicia is actually sewing with her daughter right now, and she's listening. Thumbs up for sewing. Um, anyway, this Brave Rider mom was a quilter, and she had this thing where every time a child turned 12, they got to spend a year quilting before they started school with her in the mornings. So they'd get up, have breakfast, and the first thing they'd do is work on this quilt design, learning how to quilt. She did it with her boys and her girls. What a lovely legacy for that family. I think what I'm trying to convey here is a lot of times boredom is just a lack of challenge, a lack of imagination. These kids want to get their hands on real life. Let them. Give them the saw with supervision. Help them use your sewing machine. Hand them a needle and thread. You know, some of you pointed out earlier on the Clear the Coffee Table the idea of doing beads. That's wonderful. Anything that feels real is satisfying to kids. Okay, I have a third one. Are we bored yet? Are we still doing good? I have a couple more, but, you know, we don't have to do them. <laughs> Give them the saw. Yeah, exactly right. And what am I saying, Jen? Um, okay, just say real quick, yes, you want to keep going, or that's enough to get started. Okay, Jenny says keep going. Anybody else? Keep going, please. Going, going. Okay, good. <laughs> All right, awesome. I'll keep going. Okay, the next one that I had in mind is recording yourself. It's so easy now. When my kids were young, I had to like risk the $1,000 video camera on my children, and we did. You have iPhones with hopefully insurance. <laughs> I suggest getting insurance. <laughs> um, let them record themselves. 
They love it. I remember at the dawn of podcasting, when I wasn't even doing it yet, my kids were addicted to the Harry Potter podcasts because the books hadn't been finished yet. And the kids were interested in hearing all about theories of what would take place in the newly next books as they were going to be released. So they really loved that role model. So they took over my, my laptop and they started doing what they called interesting conversations with Jacob and Katrin. <laughs> and I still have them. Oh my gosh. Jacob's voice is all high-pitched. It hadn't changed yet. Katrin is all trying to sound sophisticated, and she's like eight years old. Let them record themselves. Let them start their own little podcast. Uh, when I was young, really young, in my teens, and I was a babysitter, I used to take a tape recorder with me when I babysat, and I would do radio shows with the kids that I babysat. They were enthralled. It was the easiest way to spend the afternoon or the early evening with kids that weren't my own. They all wanted the mic. Well, how much easier is that now? So give your kids a recording device. They should be able to see themselves or hear themselves and let them rip. You know, I think I shared one other time about, yes, oh, okay, let's see. Sunny says, my daughters do their own talk show talent show and it's called Awesome Sauce. Oh my goodness. And then Jenny's daughter pretends to scope all the time. Another one's, oh, Allie, your daughter has a YouTube channel where she shares crafts. That's incredible. I love that. I know I was watching someone's daughter on Periscope the other night, and she is every couple days singing for a live audience. How crazy. It's so fun. So letting your kids use real tools, letting them record themselves, they should actually be getting... Oh, hello, dry just. Um, they should be getting some opportunities for sharing themselves and presenting themselves in public. This is a skill they're going to need for the rest of their lives. So you may as well get that in now. Um, so yeah, recording yourself. So we've got clear the coffee table. We've got use real tools. Oh yes, Jeanette's made their own commercials. That's adorable. Um, and then the third thing is record self. Would you give a topic, Louise asks. Well, only if they ask you for one. They might already have one. Here's the thing. None of this is about coercion. This is about invitation. So if they need you to brainstorm with them, brainstorm with them. If you look like you are trying to get them to do something so they'll stop bickering, they're going to resist you. It all comes from a tone of voice, an openness, a I'm on your side. I'm just here to offer you some ideas. And you know, the truth is, if they're hungry and they need a turkey sandwich, or they're tired and they haven't spent a lot of time sleeping and resting, or they're in a growth spurt and their hormones are going crazy, nothing you suggest is going to work. These aren't fail-safe suggestions. These are just options, ways, things to try that'll work sometimes, okay? So keep that in mind. All right, another one that worked great in our family, backyard picnics. When my kids were really little, we had a lot of fun pretending to be animals and they would eat their food off of plates and I would cut it up small and they'd crawl around <laughs> and we would do that in our little, actually we had no backyard, we'd do it in our little side yard or out in the main you know, shared space of our condo development. Um, we did picnics that were Japanese teas. We did picnics where all we brought were, you know, hummus and pita bread, and we sat on a big blanket with all of our library books. It doesn't have to be complicated, but there's something about a blanket that anchors the outside experience. If you just say, go outside, it sounds like you don't like your children. <laughs> but if you say, you know what, guys? We're tired of being in the house. Let's get outside. I'm going to make you some special treats. You guys set up. Here are some resources. And you can keep these handy. Maybe have a basket that already always has a picnic blanket in it. Maybe in that basket there's a little jar, and they get to go pluck flowers from your yard and turn it into a vase. Maybe there's a little plank of wood that they can use to set that jar. In other words, make it easy for yourself. I remember um, my good friend Dottie, she had a little, we had these tiny little balconies in our condos, and she just took these two futons and stuck them out there and put a low table, and that was the place that 
the kids could always go. They had a basket for library books. They had a collection of seashells and stuff they could use to arrange for a little outing. They could bring their dolls. But yeah, just a little blanket time outside feels special. And so many of you are already doing it, so I'm going to blow forward here. Okay, one more. Uh, well, I actually have two more. Um, I want a mud kitchen, says Louise. Less decision fatigue if the basket is ready. Exactly. Thank you for that. Um, and Jen says, great minds think alike. Yeah, so as you are thinking of any of these strategies, preparation is key, right? It means when you're shopping in the supermarket, your mind is thinking, what could I buy now that I can use for my clear the coffee table time in a month or in a week? So think ahead, right? Um, if you have an old blanket, just set it aside, you know? Picnics, forts, they all depend on stuff that you're willing to have spills on and get messy. So if you know what that is in advance, you're much more likely to take advantage of it. Okay, another one. Treasure hunt. Get a series of note cards, you know, like this. You can, they don't need to be on a spiral, but, you know, note cards. And train your children how to follow a treasure hunt. Now, this one does take preparation. So maybe instead of planning a week of homeschooling activities, during that time instead, plan a treasure hunt. You can do it when you're not with your kids, and you can keep the cards and whatever the little surprises are going to be separate from your life. Store it in a box, put it at the back of the pantry, and then on the day gone wrong, you pull it out. It's ready to go. You're not thinking about whether you'll do it. You'll just do it. It's the time. You'll know, right? And they can be pictograms if your kids don't read yet. You don't have to write rhyming clues. They don't have to be beautiful clues. <laughs> they just have to be clues that lead somewhere. You can be obvious, like, you know, go behind the couch. <laughs> or it can be, you know, something rhyming and adorable. I didn't plan anything, so my brain is blank. But it's nice if there's a treasure hunt for each child, because then there isn't arguing. But if you only have, you know, a small amount of energy, then you can assign them to be one clue at a time. But make sure there's a little surprise treat at the end for each person, because that's the key, okay? And for those of you who don't want to write <laughs> and are tired and feeling like, no, I can't do this, you can also do treasure hunts with yarn, where they're all down for their nap, and you get up and you just tie it at one end and you start walking around the room and looping it like a spider web and they have to follow the yarn to the end of their treasure. And then whatever that treasure is, it should be something fun to play with. You know, a card game or a little, you know, jacks. I like jacks and pickup sticks a lot because we forget that those are really fun. A super ball is great. It doesn't have to be expensive. Bubbles, oh my gosh, blowing bubbles, great one. Um, so, does that make sense? Does that sound good? And then, of course, the last fail-safe resets the thermostat of any day of the week is Poetry Tea Time. And you do know all about that because I've shared it so many times. I recently, yesterday, just did a full-on webinar on it, so I'm not going to repeat it here. But I will, at some point, post that for all of you to see. But you can go to Brave Writer right now and... On the home page, if you click on Brave Writer Program and then go down to Brave Writer Lifestyle and click there, Poetry Tea Time is the top page on that part of the site. Yes, Poetry Tea Time, Louise says, works every time. It absolutely always works. <laughs> just, I don't know why, just resets the thermostat better than anything else. Rebecca says, Poetry Tea Time has revived our schooling. I, I'm going to tell you something because you guys are here live and I really appreciate it. Um, we're getting ready to share Poetry Tea Time in a much bigger way through Brave Writer. So that announcement is coming soon. There will be a lot more resources and help. If you are a Pinterest fan, go to the Brave Writer Pinterest page because Jeanette rocks. She has recipes and pins and everything you could ever possibly need to have a fun Poetry Tea Time. So those are my ideas for hacks when you're at your wit's end. <laughs> Does anyone have any final thoughts, questions, ideas um, that they want to share? And I see that our, our numbers have dwindled just a little bit, so I want to be sensitive to time. Let's see, Alicia did their first poetry tea time today, and it was good. 
Jen says that sometimes they do poetry and popcorn. I love it. Alicia says even her 13-year-old boy had a great time. K.N.M. Kendall says, loved this so much. Awesome. I'm glad. I'm glad this was helpful. Thank you for all the little hearts. That makes me happy. I love seeing the colors. It's really good. And thank you for inviting your friends. For those of you who don't know, I am scoping every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 4 p.m. And tomorrow's scope is going to be part two of brain-based learning. You can go to catch.me slash bravewriter to catch up and read brain-based learning part one, or listen to, watch. <laughs> and then tomorrow, I'm going to complete it with the other half. And I've got a book of over 45 topics now to cover on Periscope. Literally can't stop thinking about this. So I have a lot to share, and I love learning from you. And I'm glad that you all showed up today. So thank you. Thank you. If you want some free advice about writing, and you want to have daily tips that take you out of the writing rut, go to bravewriter.com. Oh, the Pinterest reference, sorry. We're Pinterest slash bravewriter. So follow our Pinterest page for a lot of great stuff. I don't do it. Jeanette does it all, but it's fabulous. Um, if you want free writing help, go to the homepage, click on the sign up button, and there is a PDF file called Free Writing Frenzy that gives you all kinds of free writing advice and tips things to do with your kids for writing, just like I did today. Thank you, Jenny, for posting my link. Um, you can sign up for our daily writing tip, and you'll get an email once a day with advice like this, but for writing. And we would love to have you. The brain-based learning link, again, is this. Catch with a K, K-A-T-C-H dot me, M-E, forward slash brave writer. If someone wants to quickly stick that in the chat window, that would be helpful. All of my Periscope recordings are living there, um, and you can watch all of them. But the brain-based learning one is part one, and we're hitting part two tomorrow. Thank you, Jenny, for posting that. And then there's the Pinterest one, pinterest.com forward slash Brave Writer. And that's true for Facebook and Twitter, too. Same thing, twitter.com Brave Writer, facebook.com Brave Writer. I love all the community interaction. Thanks for letting me host. You guys are awesome. This was really fun. Have a great week. See you tomorrow.